welcome back to the Black and Raw podcast. I am your host, Tina Kada Tondarai from Zabaya. They ain't gonna beat that. Here's a podcast that's been a dialogue and the space for black individuals. Now, now, how are young people combating online racism? Now, you might have not thought that this was a topic for discussion. Maybe it was never on your radar. It wasn't on my radar until I talked to my guest today, Rob Eshman, who has written a book called when the hood comes out, racism and resistance in the digital age. And so we talk about his book, we talk about how young people are combating online racism, how they are putting resistance to what is going on. But we also set the scene in terms of like, what is the experiences of young people online and what what can they do to combat that, you know? So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation. Rob is a lecturer, Dr. Rob Eshman, who is actually teaching at Columbia University, did his master's in did his master's and PhD in social work. And so you're gonna find out a bit about that. You're gonna find out what it was like being a PhD student. You're also gonna find out about his children and how he's helping prepare them to deal with online racism and racism just in general so i hope you guys really enjoyed the episode please let me know what you think in the comment section and here is my conversation with dr rob eshman um so rob welcome to the black and Raw podcast it's really good to have you on yeah thanks so much for having me i'm excited to, to have this conversation no, it's blessed. It's blessed. I really like your background, by the way. Is that is that a real background? Like, is that your house with like the nice this exposed is, brick yeah. and everything? I like it. This like is it. this is this is this is my this is my place in New York. Um, you know, I feel lucky feel lucky to have it. I'm on the Upper West Side, and so lots of pre war buildings here. Um, and so the the exposed brick is a is a nice vibe. I feel. Yeah, I always love exposed brick. Whenever it's anywhere in the building, I'm like. Oh just looks good like i don't know what it is it just it just i like the feature um of exposed brick um yeah you can't find yeah i I imagine upper west side new york is probably the place to find them you got your brownstones and all of those other buildings yeah you know we actually we don't have as many brownstones over here as other parts of the city i think there's there are taller apartment buildings Mm. um but but there's lots of older buildings i guess there's some further west than where i am um yeah man but you know throughout new york there's a lot of beautiful architecture Lots of history, um, you know, neighborhoods are changing over time, um, you know, which is uh, interesting to learn about, sometimes sad to learn about. But, you know, I'm 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 fairly new to the city, man. It's only been two years. I'm still getting to know it. OK. And where did you so where where did you I was say come from? But <laughs> where were you yeah. before? <laughs> yeah. So I'm born and raised in Chicago. I, I went to Chicago, you know, I, you know, my, lived my whole life there. Didn't leave until after I got my PhD in 2017, and then I moved to Boston and lived there for four years. Mm. Um, I was working at BU before coming to Columbia two years ago, so I've been in New York for two years now. Oh, nice, bro. So you mentioned that you did your PhD. Um, so what did you study, and why did you study it? Um, and I asked that knowing what you studied, but I just wanted because <laughs> it's yeah, quite similar. Yeah. To what I've done. Of course, of course. Yeah, I got I got my master's and PhD in social work. Um, and the reason I studied it, so I it's this is funny, man. When I um when I was applying to grad school, all the programs I applied to, except for University of Chicago, were sociology. So that's what my major was, and that's you know, kind of the field I wanted to go into. And the one school of social work that I applied to was U Chicago, and it's because there was a sociologist in the department I wanted to work with, Charles Payne, mm. who was um you know, heading up a reform effort called the Woodlawn Children's Promise Community. And so I really wanted to be a part of research that was directly tied to actual trying to make change in communities. And that's what I, you know, so I really wanted to to learn from from Dr. Payne in that way. Um, and, and for me, it was enough to, to change discipline. Or, you know, I feel like, you know, I've still been trained by sociologists. I, I you know, you, you know, publish in sociology journals, but I, you know, really developed an identity as a social worker during my time, which is, you know, social work is a profession, you know, we call ourselves the caring profession. Um, you know, people can be critical of that, but I think that one thing that ties social workers and social work research together is that we are concerned with marginalized communities, marginalized populations, people who need help. Um, and so I'm, you know, grateful to be in a field that, you know, 
people care about not just the you know the ivory tower and, mm. and doing research, but also doing research that matters that has an impact. Studying things that right, studying social problems that, that we that we're actually seeking to to fix, as opposed to just um, you know needing to pretend as if we're looking at it objectively. Yeah, I mean, I, I I really like that in terms of what you're saying. Like, yeah, I did my master's in social work um, and, and didn't want to go and do a PhD. Not yet. I would love doctor in front of my name. It would be cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I can wait. I've had my fair share of education. Um, but I like in terms of what you said that it's, you know, you're doing the research part of it, which is aiming to like improve people's lives as well. Like we need the social workers on the ground, but we also need the social workers that are doing the studies that are doing the research base. You know, I think in social work, they always, we always like to say like um, evidence-based practice. And that's where you guys are providing, you're providing the evidence that's helping the social workers on the ground be like, okay, how does this work? What is going on right now? What can I use to sort of help, help me? You know, you've got plenty of theories and um, plenty of literature that supports social workers in that role. Um, so I, I find that really interesting. Um, how did you find doing a PhD? Oh man, I enjoyed it. I think um, for me, it, it felt strange that right, I, I had a stipend, right? I was getting paid to go to school. It felt strange that I was getting yeah. paid to go to a school that, you know, people are paying $50,000 a year to go to. And so I, I felt like it was an extremely privileged place to be. Um, I, I really kind of grew up when I was in grad school. Um, I had a young family and was able, you know, I had I was always hustling with side jobs. Mm. But I really felt like, right, I, I knew where my health insurance was coming from. It was just a great situation. And, you know, um, I remember studying for qualifying exams one summer, which is right at, at, at my school. It's basically you get a, a reading list of a couple hundred books and articles, and then you have to read them all and then take a kind of take home written essay test at the end of the summer. And I just remember, you know, in the moment realizing like this is such a moment of privilege where my job this summer is just to read all day, every day. Yeah. And as someone who loves to read, right, it's crazy that that like that was what I had to do for work was just go, you know, I'm going to cafes with a big fat book, and a stack of papers, <laughs> yeah, and I'm just reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it was it was really hard. Um, it was tough, but I think that it was a space where I found support both from other students, um, from you know, the community, um, from from my mentors. And I, you know, I really enjoyed the time. And I know where I think grad school is hard for a lot of people and not every environment is is, um, is, is as supportive as, as what I experienced. And, and, you know, even people who were there didn't feel it necessarily the way that I did. But it's something that I um, I want for my students to be able to have that same type of experience where they really feel like that this is a time that they can take advantage of and, and take the time to learn and think about what, what it is they want to do and not feel pressure of time. And to morally, you know, feel like it's an opportunity for them to really, um, you know, um, start something, right? Because like, all you got to do in grad school is start it off and then you have your career to keep on answering those questions. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as you said, it was a huge privilege, isn't it? Yeah, I can imagine, like, not everyone is reading people, but if you are a reading person, then, yeah, your job is just to read all summer and you can go and do it however you want, go and read in Central Park or go to a cafe, you know, that that does sound good. Like, yeah, definitely hard because when you first said 100 books and articles, I was like, boy, that's a lot. <laughs> I know you <laughs> yeah. said he's got the whole summer, but yeah. that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, the list the list was really long. It was it was tough to get through. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I think that that we have like from year to year people take notes on the readings and they'll pass them along to the other classes. Yeah. So where people are, you know, like the 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 folks who are going through it are, are sticking together and trying to help each other through it. So it was definitely tough, but I'm also grateful that I got a chance to do it. Yeah, definitely. And, which was one of my questions actually. So, so the way it works is that there, you have to pick three subjects that you have to master and they give you a bibliography for those subjects. And then a fourth subject, you, you ask a question yourself. And I asked, I like the, the question I asked was how does the internet change racial discourse? And so that is kind of uh, when you look back at, you know, when I think about my book, when the hood comes off, 
that I started doing the reading and thinking about these issues when I was in grad school. Well, you know, I hadn't identified that as what I was going to do with my dissertation, but I knew I was interested in knowing as much as I could to try to answer that question that was important to me. Yeah. You know what you just did? You just did my segue for me. (laughs) (laughs) Which is brilliant. So I guess your book, yeah, tell my audience about your book. Um, when when I first saw like your message in terms of getting you to come on a podcast, I started looking at some of your stuff and I was like, man, this is a very fascinating book and very for the times as well. Um, so yeah, just tell my audience a little bit about your book. Yeah, yeah. So the book is about the ways that technology changes how we experience, understand and respond to racism. And so I, I use, you know, I, I have interviews with over 80 college students from around the country um, in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Boston, Atlanta. Um, I have survey data from several thousand people. And then I also have um, millions of tweets over a 10 year period where I'm looking at different trends and how people ah, talk about race years. online. So it's a whole lot of data. But then it really is a story driven book where I'm, I'm, I'm telling the stories of the people that I, I talk to 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 really um, help us understand and process pretty complex ideas and concepts around race, but then you know we would then put into a conversational um, tone. And so you know I, I I really enjoyed writing the book. It's a book that challenges us to question how things are changing, with the right moving from being more subtle to more overt um, in online spaces, and how people are responding. And I think that the second half of the book and the, the part that it really excites me the most is, is talking about resistance and how people are using digital tools to challenge racism, despite the fact that racism can get so ugly in some online spaces. Mm, yeah. So like I said, really a book of the times, you know, because you're you're taking what young people are going through right now and, um, you know, in their sort of lens of race and racism and sort of seeing, okay, what is going on? But then also how can young people build resilience and resistance and what can they do to sort of combat that um and i guess while writing your book was there anything that sort of made you upset like anything you came across you're like damn this is tugging on the heartstrings yeah man there's a couple there were a couple situations where students shared stories of incidents that happened to them on campus around issues of race that um, you know, like being called the N-word and being forced to move out of a dorm and right, things like this. Right? So I think, I think, um, um, and just to, to, to bring out one specific story that a, a Black woman told me a story of how she was called the N-word in her dorm floor. And she spoke with the, the, the kind of the dorm master, like the adult who's supposed to handle those situations. Mm. And instead of handling it proper, properly, that adult told other students that the student had come to the complaint about the incident. And as a result of the bullying from students being like, hey, you're, why are you getting this person in trouble? They were just joking that the, the black woman moved out of the dorm. And I think when I heard that story, I stopped the interview, I stopped recording. And I told her, I was like, hey, this is crazy that that happened. It's crazy that this person who, who had the, the responsibility to take care of you didn't. Um, and I wanted to check in to make sure that, that they were all right. Um, and I wanted to connect them to someone Um, you know, at the university who I knew would make a fuss about this incident if they knew about it. Mm. And so, right. So I I wanted to stop the interview and and figure out, okay, how can we actually make this right? And right. Like that that they're right. I mean, you can't, you can't go back in time and make it right, but admit right. But there, I I knew some people who would make sure there were consequences for that. Right. And so um, to my knowledge, they didn't want to follow up. They didn't want to go through those things. But then, but for me, that was a moment where I had to stop. Like, right, like this is more than a conversation at this point. And now that right, like I, I felt a sense of responsibility to connect, um, you know, this student with resources to, to get them help when they're in an environment where they were not right being given the help that, that we would expect them to get. Right. Like think about, uh, you know, that, that student's parents paying a bill to a school that's allowing that to happen to their child is, is you know, um, it, it's, it's difficult to wrap your head around. Yeah, it's awful. That and, is. Definitely. Go yeah. On, finish yeah. Finish yeah. No, you know, and I would just say that, right. It kind of illustrates one of the points that I make in the book is right. I, I compare uh, um, experiences with racism online and in person, and they happen in both places. Right. And this is an outlier event where everybody on a, on a predominantly white campus is not getting called the N word every day. 
Mm. But when it happens, how are people responding? And this was it, right? There were several examples of the administration not responding the right way, of the adults right, who are supposed to respond not responding in the right way. And that's something that, that is really powerful about the findings in my book is hearing from students about how they created their own informal consequences for people who engage in racism online, that online they make it uncool and unpopular to say something racist. They make sure that if you say something racist, that that people are going to be commenting on your posts and sending you messages and making you feel uncomfortable doing right with that type of behavior. And I think that that's so important because when we let it go, when we let it slide, then people begin to think, oh, this type of racism is okay. Yeah, they think that right that there's nothing to stop it from happening again and again, and so like part of what excites me about the book is, and when we have situations where ugly things happen, the students of color are not just you know standing by and watching it and being silent, but instead that they feel like online, especially they have the power to stand up, that they have a voice, um, and that they don't you know it's not something that they have to to take sta- uh, sitting down. Yeah, it's sad that we sort of have to do that you know because it shouldn't be happening in the first place but it's also Mm -hmm. great that people aren't taking aren't taking it like they're being like nah mate we're not accepting that that's that's not how we want to function that's not how we want our society to be um and that's really empowering because definitely for that girl like you can just imagine like the person you told who you thought was going to keep it quiet and is like responsible for your safety sort of went against all of that like it's 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 very it's very disheartening when it's sort of the people that are supposed to protect you aren't the ones taking the action um yeah and especially for young people where you want you want that sort of older person to be able to sort of help you with that um and you want your institutions to be able to help you with that but it's yeah it's it's good that as you were saying some of the young people are sort of taking it back and being like nah that's not on. That's not on at all. I'm not having it. That's right. That's right. That's right. No, that's real. And that, you know, I think that the research says that the most common way to respond to microaggressions is to just not respond. And that's something that uh, um, when talking with students, one student told me when he, he, he talked about a person making an online microaggression, making a racist joke. And he said, no one has ever made a comment like that where someone else doesn't respond to tell them that it's messed up. And that is just a completely different world than what we expect in offline situations where the norm is to not respond in one space, the norm is to respond in the other. And that's just it, it's something that is hugely empowering for students to, um, you know, to see and witness uh, and be able to participate in challenging uh, racism in, in all its forms, whether it's you know, open and overt or whether it's more subtle and hidden. Yeah, what do you what do you think on that in terms of like you challenge microaggressions when it's online, but rather rather you when you you don't challenge microaggressions when it's in person? Like the only sort of thing I can think of is that you sort of I guess in person it's more of the immediate sort of okay, what are people going to say or look like? How are they going to look at me if I suddenly respond in such a way, but they didn't see the microaggression, they're just seeing me respond. And, you know, for men, like as a black man, you're like, oh, there's just an angry black man now, you know, you don't want that label. But online, I guess there is a bit of a difference. So I want to get your perspective on that. What do you think are the differences? Yeah, yeah. So I think there are, there are a number of barriers, things that make it harder for us to respond um, in face-to-face situations that, that are removed online spaces. So one is timing, how quickly things tend to happen and that you may not think of what to say fast enough, Mm. right? Um, um, We think about online, you you may see something, you may be upset and you can take a couple hours to think about it, to calm down, to figure out how you want to write and then write your response, right? Mm. Um, You write another another piece with the timing is space is that, you know, in person, the only people who hear this microaggression are the people who are in that room who are in that space. So if you're the only black person or person of color in a certain space and you experience a microaggression, there's right like like you you may feel like you're alone and that right. How do I right? Um, um, am I is it even safe for me to respond online? Right, things even private conversations tend to be a little bit more public, and so you may feel less alone. There's less responsibility on you alone as an individual to respond and it's more of a community or a collective response where, where other people can step in when you don't have the energy that day to say something 
right? And then there may be an issue of interpretation. Sometimes microaggressions are so subtle, we don't know whether or not they're actually uh, racist. And so we question, like, oh, was that racism or is this person a jerk? Was that mm-hmm. racism or am I being too sensitive here? And when you're in an online space, you get to get the you know, opinions of multiple other people who are like, yeah. oh, no, no, yeah. that was that was messed up. But here's why. Here's a link to some information to tell you more about this trend that this person is, is right? Like, this is kind of a textbook microaggression. Here's why. Let's talk about it. And so you have more people who can kind of have your back with that interpretation. So I think that right, those are just some examples of ways that right online it becomes easier to respond to racism. It's less there's less responsibility on any one person to do, figure out that it's racist. You don't right, people don't have to be uh, find the time to be in the same place at the same time to have a discussion. I had one student talk to me about how he tried to challenge a microaggression that happened in person, and the white person who who you know and uh, engaged in the microaggression, or, or I guess to give more details on the story, a student was using some slang, and the white person said, "Oh no, that's right." Like it was, it was kind of challenging that way of speech, and then the guy's like, "Oh no, no, this is." This is slang is a way of talking. And here's why this is appropriate for me to speak in that way. And a white student in the middle of him talking just walked away. He wasn't willing to have that conversation. So then the student posted online and had, you know, dozens of people engaged in a discussion about the use of slang Mm. on a college campus. And so, right, he by going online, he was able to create space for this discussion, as opposed to what happened in the face to face setting is that the moment was gone. There was no one there to discuss it with. And so, right, like, like it, it, it really gives space and allows more people to, right, allows there to be a community to have your back and to, and to grow together as you, you know, as you, as you um, highlight different ways that racism works. Yeah. So you sort of, yeah, hit it quite on the nail there in terms of like the fact is that in online, you've got online, you've got more sort of time, you've got more space, you've, you know, you can, you can figure your witty response, you know, like when something happens to you in person and you're like, oh, I'm so frustrated that you've just done that to me. And I want to say something, (laughs) but I can't. And then you're like, oh no, I don't have my witty, like funny, sarcastic response ready. Um, But online you can take a time, you can pause, you can get ready to be like, okay, no, actually this is how this has annoyed me. And you can sort of articulate your feelings a lot more better um and as you were saying that there's a community of people that are there to support you to be like nah this was wrong or even to challenge you and be like nah i actually don't think this was but then at least you're maybe then having a dialogue where you'd be like okay why don't you think that was racist like it might be another black person saying why i don't think that's racist and you'd be like let's have a discussion about that it 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 also sort of allows for nuances in the conversations to be had Mm. rather than when you're in person you sort of just want to you want to go for the killing blow as quick as possible you don't want to think about nuances because you're pissed off (laughs) that someone has done something to you yeah yeah no that's that's exactly real and i think that it can be right the nuance is something that the written word it may be a little bit better at getting to those things that you may be you may not only can you say it better you can say it better in anticipation of how people might receive it and if you think that you know someone is going to get def- right like it like it's normal for people to get defensive if you want to tell them that something they did was problematic and it right you're able to to strategize what is the best way for me to get this point across mm-hmm. while anticipating how it may be difficult for someone to acknowledge this or to see this from my perspective. And so I think that, right. It, it, it's so cool to see, um, you know, how, how young folks in particular are finding ways to, to communicate these things. And, you know, and it's something that to be honest, I was not expecting when I started to study, I was more um, getting into it to, to think about, um, how our experiences with racism were changing. And I was, you know, surprised and, you know, and, and was made more hopeful by the ways that, that students weren't running away from, you know, online spaces being, you know, having more aggressive feeling racism, but then said that they were, you know, digging in and, and deciding like, no, no, we're not going to let that stand and find a ways to fight back. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what would you say are the the challenges online in terms of what you are seeing with young people and experiencing racism? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that one, we know that racism, online racism happens a lot. It may happen a lot more. It may, um, you know, when it happens, it may be more explicit than things that they experience in face-to-face situations. And that can, you know, that can wake people up sometimes. Um, but, you know, a big challenge is online activism is, is 
you know, makes a lot of noise. And the challenge is figuring out how do we translate this to now policy um, changes? How do we translate this to face to face activism? How do we get people to get involved, not just by retweeting something, but also by showing up when mm-hmm. it's time to, to put some money or some time, um, you know, in, into the struggle? Um, and so I think that, that that is one of the, the you know, the big challenges. But I, I also think that people are rising to that challenge. And when I see online activism, I, I, I don't necessarily think that I'm seeing folks who are content with their activism staying in the online space. I think that, that they are building people who think differently about the world and who are willing to, um, you know, to, to, to use their, their time and talents to, to, to try and, um, you know, create change. Yeah, I guess one of the brilliant things about sort of um, being able to sort of build community online is that you can chat to anyone anywhere, you know, you can, yeah. you can talk like, you know, we're talking now, you're in New York, I'm in England. And like, we probably have, we probably have very different experiences of racism, but there are probably also quite a lot of similarities as well. And you can sort of gain different perspectives from people that are in the US that are in Australia that are in sort of white dominated spaces um but even those that are sort of back home um in Africa and I'm from Zimbabwe um but like getting their perspective as well because you know racism is a is a thing I guess is in there but it, it look obviously it looks completely different because almost everybody's black um uh-huh. So, but I think the fact that we can sort of engage with people all over the world and get really good different perspectives, and that sort of helps with the online activism as well, isn't it? Because you can spread your message much further than we ever were able to. Um, I I remember there were some riots in England in like 2011, and like it was through BBM, like they, they, they did it through BlackBerry Messenger um and that's the way they organize and it's just the fact that like if you can organize through like a text messaging app through a phone like mm. how can we organize now we, man it's even better it's even the connection is even better than it was in 2011 <laughs> so what wow. can we do with activism now can be really interesting i think yeah yeah i love that i I'm, i wasn't familiar you said it's called bbm yeah, yeah yeah it was black you know you know blackberry phones don't you Black what? Blackberry, Blackberry phone. Oh, Blackberry phone. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So the messaging thing that they had on them. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I think okay. I must have just said it too fast because I was used to. Oh that. yeah, I thought you were saying it was like some kind of black messaging network, and I was like, I have not heard about no, this. but that okay, would be sick, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, man, look, you had me about to take some notes and start googling this <laughs> once we got off of this. This call that sounds that sounds amazing. Okay, but very cool. Yeah, you know I love like I think that at you know on one hand some activists use social media like that like a messaging service. It's just another way. It's like an online newsletter. It's a way to reach people, and I think that's cool. And then on the other hand, you have people who are using it in new and innovative ways. And what I try to do in the book is I focus less on the big events that everyone knows about that mm. we're seeing in the news, and more on how are these things impacting people's everyday lives? How are everyday people engaging in resistance against racism? How are everyday people experiencing racism online? How is technology changing that dynamic? And so, right, like, so that is, that's kind of where, where my focus is here is, right, like thinking about where right, it doesn't have to be a hashtag that a million people see. How on your Facebook page are your experiences with race and racism and challenging racism changing? Um, but, you know, as, as we spend more and more time online for, so, you know, socializing, learning, um, you know, finding finding information. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think it's important that it's it's happening everywhere, isn't it? That Because as much as the big things in terms of like your George Floyd's and some of those other big events, like it's great that we all come together when it's all when that happens. But you're right. I think the small everyday like rebellions and the small like no we're not having this like in on our college campus that's also what's going to help with change because you're affecting sort of people's mindsets all the time like you're you're Mm. trying to get them to change their view on race and racism and and in that way you know i think that's sort of a more long-lasting version of change because 
the big thing comes, the big thing goes. You know what I mean? Like, dude, yeah. I, I, who's talking about George Floyd now? You know, <laughs> nobody. Unfortunately, like Black yeah. Lives Matter. Yeah. Like you know, here in we've got the Premier League here. They do the knee before the game, but it's sort of like they do it before every game, and it's it's great. And then they say, yeah, we, no standing up to racism and stuff like that. But it doesn't feel. It doesn't feel like anything's happening with it. Um, mm. Even though they're doing it, it doesn't feel like yeah. anything's happening with it. You know, I didn't know they were doing it. That's interesting. So now let me ask, has that, has that changed at all? Because I think we see stories periodically of soccer or football players discussing ways that they're being, you know, like someone's throwing a, a banana at them or mm. a red light, that they're, red light that, that they're experiencing racism at football games is that something that has been changing since it's taken a year like how are audiences taking it the people dislike it are they you know are they buying in how like what does it look like so funny funnily enough right um uh in terms of i'll speak on england um because i also know in spain vinicius jr gets quite a lot of racist abuse even though he's like their yeah. best he's like their best player and he's amazing and he wears number seven and it's like without Vinny, you wouldn't have got a lot of the things you've got currently recently. Um, but I'll focus on England for now. You know what? It doesn't, maybe in the stadiums, there's less sort of, I haven't been to a game for a while actually, but maybe in the stadiums, there's sort of less racism and less sort of things being thrown. But when it comes to social media, which is funny because we're talking about it, it's it's awful. Like if a black, like, especially when they go, especially when there's something like England, like whenever we see the black players go and playing for England and something happens, like we had the Euros and, you know, Gareth Southgate put like three of the black boys on the thing and we're all like, oh, these, if these guys missed the penalties, like we're screwed because you just see like vile messages of like monkey, you're this, go back to where you came from, blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah. but, but yeah. like, but then when the, when the boys do well, there's, there's nothing and the thing is you know what was funny sterling who is a um a black british jamaican um if it wasn't for him england wouldn't have been in the euros final yet yeah afterwards he got so much abuse so much hate um and so it's crazy what you see online like the balls people have to comment in someone's comment section such racist and awful things you just I don't know, as black people, when as black people here in the UK, when we're just like, we already know that something's gonna happen if the yeah. England team yeah. doesn't do well. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, man. So you know, because some of this I don't I don't follow football too much to be honest, and unless it's the World Cup. Um, but then I do see these articles. So that that is that is interesting. Um and, and I know how big the sport is, and I remember reading about the hate that that the, the you know the the UK soccer player got from missing that um, you know the 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 kind of what, what do you call it? what do you call it after time after it was the penalties time. yeah yeah the penalty yeah. kicks and I remember I remember reading about how bad it it, it got and and you know and, and just feeling horrible for the guy um, so you know it's something else man right like you know I think that 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 a lot of times um, in the U S we think about racism you know, just being a problem at home. And then you realize, no, this is, this is the a global ideology that folks, you know, immigrate to the U S and they have their own racial, you know, uh, kind of notions that they're bringing with them, that everybody has an opinion and everybody, you know, they're kind of raised in context where they're trained to believe uh, um, different things. And I think, right. The reality is colonialism is global mm. and uh, right, there's nowhere that is not impacted by the legacy of white supremacy, um, which is, you know, it, it, it is tragic to to realize kind of the global scale of racism. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Like, like as I was saying before, you know, there, there there's differences, but there's similarities. There's a lot of similarities. Um, and I guess for you sort of um, as a father, um, what would you say sort of scares you about raising a boy in sort of we, in so in this social media sort of 21st century world yeah man so i i have two boys and a girl congratulations oh thank you thank you yeah no i love my kids man and and i think that i definitely am scared of them experiencing racism i think that i as a parent i try to prep them for those experiences that are going to be inevitable 
And so they have an understanding of what racism is, where it comes from. And really, you know, I want them to know that they can um, externalize that. That is a problem of the world. That is not a problem with you. There's nothing wrong with you. But there are some people who who have problematic ways of thinking. Um, but, you know, to, to, to get into specifics, one of the things I'm worried about Right, like I opened up the book talking about how the first time I got called the N word was playing video games, and my kids love playing video games. Yeah, online. <laughs> yeah. I, I just try to make sure. That I, yeah, right. <laughs> like I just try to go into the settings and make sure. Hey, when you're playing Fortnite, the only people you can hear are your friends. Yeah, right. And it's funny because there's been different times where I'll hear an unfamiliar voice and be like, "Yo, who is that?" They sound grown. And, you know, sometimes somebody's uncle or something will have the stick and we'll be playing. And so, right, like I do, I check in on those things. Um, but, of course, things happen and, and, and they get exposed to things that, that I'm not aware of. I remember, mm. um, you know, my oldest got a VR headset and it, and people were using ugly language in the VR headset. And my youngest, who, who just used it, he's the one who told me, like, oh, yeah, they're, they're, this is what they were saying. So I think that, you know, you can we can do our best to moderate the you know what it is they are exposed to but i think at the end of the day can't stop them from from being exposed to ugliness and for me what i try to do is just maintain a relationship with them where they feel open and comfortable sharing those things with me so that we can process them together as opposed to them experiencing it and not knowing you know how to think about it or or, or it having an undue effect on on the you know their their self identity yeah so you said in terms of that you pre- you prepare them for that. So is that sort of how you're saying you prepare them and just making sure that they know it's not you, it's an external thing of how the world views us. Like, and you can always come to me, you can always come to your mom if you if there is something that worries you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't have a curriculum that I follow. What I do is I respond to things as they come up. And I respond honestly and without simplifying them for children, if that makes sense. So I think often what will happen is my oldest will um, have a question or comment, and I will answer it with the Morena, with the detailed, complex answer, and I'm doing so in the presence of his younger brother and sister. And what that does is it means that my kids from a young age, right, because in my mind, I don't know, right, I think that, that – for me, at being a parent, I, I wasn't sure at what age do I introduce these ideas to my kids. I don't know. So mm-hmm. what I do is when they come up, then I talk about them. Yeah. And um, it means that my youngest two are getting that information earlier than my oldest did. Right. Because a lot of times the, the, these are conversations that start with the oldest having a question or an experience that, 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 that he wants to share. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that that is the way that they learn. Like one of, one of the stories I talk about. In the book is the first time I took my kids to a protest and they saw a sign that said, um, really, it was a protest of, of um, um, conditions in prison during COVID. And one of the signs said, release them all. My kids are like, what does that mean? You're going to release all the prisoners? Aren't there bad guys in jail? <laughs> so look, my kids learned about prison abolition that day, right? This is right. Mm-hmm. Prison abolition is the idea, right? Is, is the idea of imagining what would society look like to, right, that did not have a prison. How would we get to a point where we don't need prisons, where when people need help, they get help instead of being punished for being desperate? And I think did that right. So this is a very complex discussion, uh, right? This is a this is these are theories that that you know you know folks have been pushing for a long time, and activists have been working towards for a long time. And because it was written on a sign, and my kids were exposed to it, we had a discussion about it that day. And so I think that's how our role is. Right? I try and. Like I, I just want to be, I just want to be talking with them all the time, and so that when things come up, then I can respond to them as needed, right? Yeah, the benefits of having a, what do you call it, a dad that's a scholar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'll oh, go on. I was just gonna say, man, you you don't need the PhD in order to <laughs> to you know have a relationship with your kids where you all talk about things that that hurt you or that scare you. Right. And yeah. I think that, that that's the key is just maintaining that relationship. Definitely. Yeah. Because I, I think in terms of with my parents and my family, um, there's stuff that's all we can talk about. Like, I think we sort of do all have a good relationship with each other. I can't speak on my brother, and my sister, um, but I think for me, sort of, I have quite a good relationship with everybody in the family. 
um, where we can sort of discuss things and we, you know, we've had topics about abortion and they may they they may not agree with me and I might not agree with them, but like we can have those sort of discussions. Um and it is important to be able to foster a place where we can have those discussions. Um and as you're saying, you know, prison a- abolitionist is a very um it's a very nuanced topic because yeah, you thought, oh what, we're gonna we're gonna let all the pedophiles and the serial murderers free. And then it's like, well, it's more to it, isn't it? There's more to why people um are involved in crime. You know, for someone that's done sociology and social work, you know the reasons for why people do crimes and what can lead people to do crimes. And if we had systems that got people help before, then you would probably have a less reduced crime rate. But that's quite a, a loaded topic. That's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, it really is, man. It really is. And I think that, that you know, that, that there are scholars and activists who deal with the hard cases of abolition, right? I think there's a paper um, I, I, I cite in, in a, a paper I wrote with some colleagues about abolition. It's called What like what to Do with the Rapist, right? This is this, this idea of an abolitionist problem of, you know, what it, like people feeling uncomfortable about the idea of just letting the doors open. And I think part of the answer is that abolition is not just about prison reform. It is about societal reform. Mm-hmm. So, right. What are the services that we want to provide in our society that would prevent, uh, um, you know, the, these types of crimes. And so, uh, um, and, and I think that the reality is right. Like a disturbingly high percentage of you know incarcerated folks have you know mental health or um you know addiction issues yeah and so these are the types of right like we if we had better wraparound services then right right there are folks who who need social supports they don't need to be locked up but they need they need society to give them a little bit more right um you know you think about folks getting involved in the drug economy it's not because they they're choosing that over investment banking it's because society is failing folks and and rather that they're, they're trying to, to make it any way that they can so yeah. what does it mean to have a more equitable society that does not you know where we're you know education is not you know kind of a, a the sifting ground that it is now that privileges some over others yeah definitely and you know we see a lot of people that experience crime or that are involved in crime have sort of had a lot of childhood early childhood traumas and it's like okay what happens if we had services that were able to give families early help and were able to properly support families so you avoid all of those issues when they get older that you know they can grow up to be healthy individuals and within society um so yeah there's a lot that sort of i think yeah as we can do in sort of society change um which could be needed um I also wanted to ask um, the choice of your book um, in terms of titling it, uh, When the Hood Comes Off. Um, mm-hmm. Quite striking cover. I like it, to be honest with you. The red with the KKK mask is it's very it's very striking. It grabs your attention. It grabs the eye. Um, uh, yeah. Why did you I, why did you go with that? If you mind me asking. Yeah. Yeah. No. So um, I talk a little bit. Right. So, so the, the hood is it's just a very. Um, there, there maybe is no bigger symbol of racism in the U.S. than the KKK hood. When we think about the, you know, one of the purposes of the hood is to hide the identity of the people behind it. That the people in the in the Ku Klux Klan, right, which is a racist terrorist organization, were engaging in murder, destruction of property, intimidation. Um, but these were regular, ordinary people. Behind those hoods, you had pastors, you had teachers. You had police officers, you had judges, you had lawyers, you had shop owners, and they needed to put on the hood to protect themselves from the consequences of their actions. And I think that, right, like a metaphor, I use that as a metaphor because since the end of Jim Crow, right, over the last 50, 75 years um, in the U.S. and, 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 you know, in a lot of other places, I think, right, in, in Europe, too, the racism has become a little bit more subtle. The mm-hmm. people are less likely to yell it in your face and they're more likely to whisper it behind your back. It's more likely to be hidden or embedded in microaggressions than it is to be part of a, a policy that, that is explicitly racist. And uh, because of that, not everyone recognizes racism. I call it masked racism. It's racism behind a mask and that not everyone can recognize it when it's wearing this mask. 
And, you know, for folks of color, people who experience racism, we know what a racism looks like even when it wears a mask. Mm. For activists, people who study racism, educators, they often know how what racism looks like. They can recognize it when it's masked. But what happens uh, online is that the hood comes off. Racism is unmasked and more people are able to see the ways that it works. All the hidden mechanisms to keep racism alive are exposed in online spaces, whether that's through discussions or whether it's through videos being shared. They, they, they kind of remind people like, hey, like you, right? like you think that the, you know, that the police are here to protect and serve. Why is it that black people are being treated like this? And it's a wake up call for many people. So that that is where the. You know, the metaphor of the book comes from is that when the hood comes off, it's about what happens when racism is unmasked by technology and how are we responding? How are we resisting? How does it change the way that we think and the way that we act? Yeah, that's a dope analogy. I like it. Um, I, I, I know what you, I know what you mean in terms of sort of masked racism. Um, I can't remember. I got it off the show Blackish. Um but the dude called it ocean breeze racism. And I always loved the sort of fact that like you can, you know, it's there, you can feel it on your face, but you can't always see it. That's how I describe Mm. racism in Britain is that, you know, someone is, but like, it's hard to tell at times because it's so like masked or it's very institutionalized or you just, you don't even realize it's happening, but you still feel that breeze on your face. You still feel that breeze on your back. Um, Yeah. So it's it's quite interesting. Um, interesting that we both sort of have. Um, I think that we all sort of know that there is a version of racism where it's hard. It's hard to tell, but you know it's there, and it's like, well, how do I even deal with it? You know, mm-hmm. how do I deal with this when it's a lot harder to sort of identify or to show other people that this is what's happening to me? Because we yeah. know it. It's just telling yeah. others that it's happening to <laughs> us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to find out in terms of, um, I guess throughout this whole conversation, we've sort of set out, um, what the issues are and what is going on for young people online in terms of dealing with racism. And I think, I think also we've, we've littered in some positivity throughout as well. We, we've talked about some positive stories of how people are combating it, but I wanted to, I wanted to sort of get your view and get sort of what does the research say? Um, about how young people can combat online racism. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, like I, uh, I think I talked about how the second half of my book discusses resistance against racism and how people feel more comfortable and, and more, you know, uh, uh, empowered challenging racism online than in person and how it can kind of flip this, this, this power switch, flip the power dynamics a little bit, whereas we feel silenced face-to-face settings online we're not silenced and 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 we have we perceive ourselves to have a little bit more of a voice um one of the you know chapter six i I talk about something i call double-sided consciousness and it really deals with this this idea of double consciousness comes from the voice and it's this it's this notion that black people because we're so aware of, of prejudice it splits our sense of self into who we are and what they think of us. And we know that, right, that awareness of prejudice has a, a negative impact in our lives, right? It, it makes us perform worse. Um, it, it, it increases health and mental health problems. Um, you're right. Uh, and, and it's something that, um, you know, it, it is painful. And right, what I talk about in that chapter is double-sided consciousness. And I explore Twitter data and, 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 and the way you know, folks use a term uh, "white people" that sounds like white people, but it's spelled differently. Mm-hmm. To collectively reject racism and the things that right that people feel about us, and to expose right white prejudice to the world um, in a way that is cathartic and is is empowering, and and kind of flips the script of what is expected from us in terms of racial dynamics. And I think it's just a form of resistance that, right, that, that by working together and being involved in, in online communities, that people are finding ways to escape the cycles of, you know, our sense of self being directly tied to what white people think of us. And so this, uh, this, this kind of external rejection of racism online is something that I find to be extremely powerful. Um, in terms of, right, I think you're, you're also kind of asking that, you know, in terms of what to do with kids is that, you know, I think that, that 
um, for kids is, is most important to have a strong sense of self, to understand what racism is. The more we teach them about racism, the less they're going to be confused by it. I think that many people have a, um, a kind of like a, 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 a wrong definition of racism where they see it as being this one explicit thing. Um, we need to have a more complex understanding of it. Um, and I think right, that the big thing that I'm seeing is that the kids know how to do this better than we do. <laughs> and really, we need to be figuring out how do we learn from the kids how to respond to racism and, and, and then figure out how we can be supportive of those types of processes and try to make them something that is right, like, like not force the kids to learn it themselves because we aren't doing anything, but to be uh, a part of that solution by you know, identifying some of the ways they innovate and using them to, um, you know, to engage in, in training and teaching youth at younger ages. Yeah. Um, you know what, when, when you were just talking, um, it was, I was literally taken back to a, a, in a, part, a time where I was at the bus stop and I can't remember why someone, I don't know if I was rude to the person or if they were just being a dick, I, I can't remember what happened. Um, but I just remember when they drove past, they're like, go back to where you came from. And then I, I think I probably said F off or something like that. And, but like, I, I remember as a kid, I sort of understood what racism was. Um, and I think I'd probably just heard it so many times. I was just like, that I'm not really bothered. Uh, like, I think, I, I think me swearing back at him was sort of my way of dealing with it. Um, but I think in terms of, yeah, for kids and for young people, as you're saying, they're sort of already doing this. They're already rejecting racism online and figuring out ways that can help them sort of deal with that. Um, and I think it's great that, you know, we are seeing that from young people. And you're saying that in terms of for adults, there's ways that we can learn from them and, you know, take take what they're doing and apply it to our own lives. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know why young people, I don't know. I feel like probably this happens with every young generation that they're usually always more willing to challenge the status quo than the neck, than the older generation. I don't know what that is like, because I'm sure you would have seen, I mean, those young people that, you know, said that the Vietnam war was wrong and they were out there protesting, you know, and like, it's always the younger generation that sort of seems to be ahead on challenging the norms of society which is yeah I don't know, just came to that thinking i was like it's quite interesting yeah no that's real i think you know there's a long history of of, of activism on college campuses um you know i think that when folks are young and they they have kind of less pressures in life they're more free to follow their ideals and i think that people can be bogged down with, with the pressures of everyday life and be less available for the fight as they get older and have more responsibilities. Um, which of course, you know, that doesn't excuse us. Responsibilities don't excuse us from the work. Uh, right. But I even, even interviewing students, I had students who were in their fourth year who say, Oh yeah, I'm retired from the fight. And then now it's the, <laughs> the first and second year's job that this year I got to work on my grade so I can get it and get a job next year. Right. And, 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 you know, that's real that, that activism can be tiring. Um, but I, you know, I think that, that, that we should be inspired by the younger generation and we should help them and, and support them. And, you know, right. Cause there are things that they, we, we have that they don't have, right. We can, we, right. When they have the, the energy and then we can bring some of the knowledge of a, Hey, this is how this worked for us. This is what did not work for us. Here's how you can avoid some of the mistakes that we ran into. Here's what we did that was successful that you can emulate if that, right. If that, if that seems like it may fit for you all. Yeah, definitely. There's things that we can sort of learn from each other, isn't it? Because then, you know, the older generation, they've been there, they fought the fight. They they know, as you were saying, what went well and what didn't go well and what can we take from that? Um, mm -hmm. I guess sort of following on from that, um, how can sort of parents and educators um, and professionals like support young people in dealing with um, racism online? Yeah, yeah. I think the best thing that we can do is to, one, teach them about racism. Right. So right now in, in America, you have a number of states where they're trying to implement laws where it, it is it is illegal to teach kids about racism in public schools. It's bonkers, but... It is. Um. It is. It's out, <laughs> it's out of control. But right. But I think that, that teaching them is so important because it helps them understand what this problem is. It makes them realize that there's nothing wrong with me. The word, look, I, what I was saying is that a, a high percentage of black folks believe that, that black people who are struggling are struggling because of their own personal choices. 
And so something like that shows a, uh, you know, uh, kind, of, kind of that we can do more within our own communities in terms of teaching people how racism works, what privilege looks like. And that doesn't mean that, it, you know, that, that, there, that we have to uh, um, think that, you know, there is not that, that, that personal responsibility is not real, right? Um, but then it means that, that having a more robust understanding of structural limitations changes whether you would blame um, an individual's choices for their situation when we see things that are um, ha- have been set up in, a, in you know in a way that that we are meant to lose or that you know other we don't have the the same tools that other people have right um, so I think you know educating kids talking to kids and then really like I mentioned before just maintaining open openness with them so that when things come up that are unexpected that may not have you may not have thought about when you're having your conversations with them about race that you're answering them. Um, and that, that that they're coming to you instead of struggling with those things on the road. Yeah. I, and following on from sort of the point you said, um, in terms of the, with the knowledge of that, OK, there are some things that sort of are stacked against you. Um, I guess from a U.S. perspective, you know, crack was brought into the hood by the CIA. You know, it was a it was it was sort of a way of like, you know, I mean, they're trying to make money for the Vietnam War. But they were like, we don't care where we make the money from. Let's just do it in in these areas where we deem people to be less than human. Let's just do that. Mm-hmm. And it's, and then that has sort of wiped out a whole generation of leaders, a whole generation of men, you know, and then people, you know, are in jail and there's men that have been um, incarcerated more often. So then we've lost a whole generation of men that are role models for children and then they've grown up without fathers. So like, if you sort of have an understanding of some of those things that has happened, you sort of give more grace to them because you're like, okay, I understand sort of what's happened, how history has impacted your community and your generation and you as a man. If you didn't have your father there to teach you how to be a man, it's very hard to know what that looks like. You have to then go through trial and error to try and figure that out. So yeah, I, I think there is an importance for being taught history, being taught how structures do impact you. But with knowledge comes power, isn't it? You know that mm-hmm. and and you hopefully will still succeed in spite of that. And it makes you just as like, listen, I had all these things going against me and I've still succeeded. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. And then right, because and part of the history is the history of the struggle. And uh, the right, the more that we learn about the struggle and how everyday normal people engage in, you know, strategies for changing the world, we're successful. And if they could do it, that means we could do it too. Mm, definitely, definitely. Um, so I've loved this whole conversation that we've had, Rob. Um, and I just want to sort of ask you one final question. Um, before I ask you, how old are your children, by the way? 16, uh, 13, and 11. That's all of good ages, good good splits. You'll be done with them soon. So soon, soon, <laughs> soon they'll be all up. <laughs> oh, no, college. no, it's, it's going too fast. I want them to slow down uh, and grow up too quickly. I think that's what my mom said. My, my, me, my brother's gone off to uni. I went off to uni. My sister will be off to uni next year. Um, so soon there'll be empty nesters. I'm sure. That, I don't think they're. I think they're looking forward to it, but not looking forward to it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but say okay. So say if your your young boys were listening to this conversation, how can something that you know help them with an understanding of themselves? Man, that is a great question. Um, I think that the that what I what that what I want them to know is that um, they are you know, part of a legacy of Black folks who believe in themselves and who are you know, in, invested in um, kind of community uplift. And so I don't want them to feel alone in the world. I, I want them to know that they are part of a community. I want them to, to feel a sense of responsibility to oppress people um, right, whether well, right, like, and, and and you know, using the term oppressed broadly, right, to think about different different ways that, that different people and communities have been marginalized. I want my kids to have an understanding of that oppression and the processes that, that create them, and I want them to be invested in being on the side of anti-oppressive work in whatever fields they you know they decide to join. 
And so I think that that, that is something that, that, that I want for them is to believe that they have the power to change the world. Bro, 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 bro. So no, thank you very much, Rob, for coming onto the podcast. Um, is there anything you'd like to plug before you leave? Um, I remember. This yeah. Time. I can edit. Yeah. That thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. Um, yeah, go get my book. My book is called When the Hood Comes Off Racism and Resistance in the Digital Age. You can order from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or at your local bookstore. You can ask them to, to order a copy um, and that'll work, too. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at rob.eshman, Twitter at Rob Eshman, or um, check out my website, robeshman.com. Brilliant. Yeah. And I'll put all those links into the show notes. So no one's got no excuse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they can go and find that. Um, so no. So thank you, Rob, for joining me. Um, I hope you have a good day as well. Amazing. You as well. Thanks so much for, for <clears throat> making time to do it, especially with the time difference. I know it's getting late over there. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It's good. I've got used to it. I've got used to it. So no, brilliant. <laughs> I hope you have a good yeah. day. All right, man. You too. Take care. So guys, that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. I really hope you got some value out of this. Please let me know what you thought about it in the comment section. Actually, let me know if you've had any experiences with online racism in the comment section and how you've dealt with that. And I'd love to hear from you. So, from me, guys, peace.